He lived a sinless, spotless life. He died on the cross to save us from our sin. He arose from the dead, and he's coming again. Amen. Amen. We're happy to see you today. Diane, would you come? Good morning. Good morning. This one's... Thank the Lord for helping me to uh, be able to stand up here this morning. I've had some physical stuff going on with my back, so I just thank him that I'm able to do this. I've received a letter from, uh, well, we get them periodically, from a Samaritan purse. And uh, I just felt led to share part of it with you. I'll have it back there. We, By the way, we still have shoeboxes back there. And uh, the things, you know, to tell you the instructions and that on how to pack it. They just reminder they are due the 15th, you know, to bring them in by the 15th. It's just, what, three weeks away, two, three weeks away. So we can pray over them. But this is uh, what they send. And it says, blessing millions of children in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm just going to read you a few, uh, one testimony here. And like I say, you know, you want to read more of it, it'll be back there. And uh, he was, this is what he was saying, this is from Franklin Graham. Earlier this year, I helped hand out shoeboxes to the Pacific Island of Saipan and Guam, American territories that were bloody battlefields in World War II. This was part of our campaign to bring the gospel to a thousand islands scared, scattered across the Pacific. Before we are done, we hope to reach half a million children who live on these far-flung islands. Guam pastor, and I don't know if I'm going to say his name right or not, okay, uh, Andy Loss, L-O-O-S, um, Lois, yeah, told us we're seeing salvation come not just to one or two children, 
but to families through Operation Christmas Child. His wife, Jennifer, said, these are doors that would not have opened if we didn't have Operation Christmas Child. Over the past two years, God has used this project to plant more than 2,000 churches in 73 countries. One of our church partners in the Philippines went the extra mile to deliver shoeboxes to a mountain tribe that had not been reached by the gospel. And the children were excited, not only to receive the gifts, but also the opportunity to enroll in the Greatest Journey Discipleship Lessons. As a result of their classes, the good news took root in their village, and a new church has been planted there. So the, yes, praise the Lord. Operation Christmas Child has been a mainstay of Samaritan's Purse since 1993. And we have delivered 178 million shoebox gifts in 170 countries and territories. Praise God. In that time, we have built a strong global network of evangelistic church partners who are ready to use your gifts to advance the gospel. Beyond that, we equip these churches with gospel booklets to hand out with gift boxes plus materials for the greatest journey classes that the Lord has used to bring more than 11.5 million boys and girls to faith in Christ. So this is just, I just really felt led to share this as a word of encouragement because I know that, you know, with most of us, we're on a monthly income, but with God's help and prayer and trusting and believing in him, he'll help us to get this accomplished. So God bless you. Good morning, church. Today is Sunday, October 25th, the very last Sunday of October. I just cannot believe it. Can't believe it. Um, I want to, on one hand, wish Mr. Donnie Gerard a very happy birthday on October 28th. And on the other hand, we want to wish the Gerard um, family our sympathies and give them our condolences as they've lost their patriarch. Mr. Gerard passed yesterday, I believe. So, God bless that family. Um, doesn't it feel like autumn to you? It doesn't feel like autumn to you? I mean, it's a, it's a little bit cooler. It is. Um, the rain trees are changing colors. I noticed that they've went from the gold. They're now pink. It's one of the few color changes we really get to see here. The Christmas displays are all coming out in the stores, and Thanksgiving will be upon us in a minute. So I just have a little something I'd like to share about some seasonal change. And um, you know, spring brings n new beauty and growth and lovely showers. Summer brings warmth and sunshine and some heat and thunderstorms. Fall or autumn, autumn's a prettier word, I think, brings coolness, and it's coming, and colors, and it's kind of, it's a falling away. And then winter brings us rest and peace. Along with its cold, it can sometimes be confining. But um, this is, is an example of um, kind of our natural seasonal during the year time. In our culture, we see glory in the youth and newness. Aging is looked upon kind of with a skeptical eye. We like to consider ourselves, most of us, the spring and summer people. It just seems, you know, more youthful. But what happens is we sort of become a little desensitized to the wonder of spring and summer. And uh, Mr. Chesterton stated, I don't have God's capacity to delight again and again, again and again at each new leaf. He keeps unfurling them. They even wave to get my attention. But the eyes of my soul glaze over. Isn't that kind of an awesome way to put that? The eyes of my soul glaze over. In autumn, the creativity of God hollers. Look at these things. 
these paper thin solar cells, which he's talking about leaves, that convert sunlight into acorns. They're everywhere. And they're made by a God who just doesn't know how to stop creating. Another um, gentleman, and I can give you the name if you want it, it's kind of more of an example of the seasons of life, you know, not so much in the, the world, the natural world, but within ourselves. He says, my parents' leaves are starting to change. Their color is silver rather than red, but the glory is the same. They might not have quite the same speed on the frisbee field, but they have the wisdom and grace of decades of joy that shines in their faces. They are taking on the beauty of autumn, showing dimensions of glory that my green summer self just doesn't even display. Autumn is the year's last loveliest smile. It shows us how beautiful it is to let things go. As we move into the season of giving and the rest that comes with winter. As followers of Christ, we have to remember to remain close to him during all the shifts of the seasons, whether it's in the natural world or within ourselves or spiritually. Autumn can draw our attention to the one man who broke through winter into an unending summer. The one who spent three days brown and dead in the dirt and came back into an indestructible green. He who once was a leaf is now a whole new tree. I think that's really powerful. So I found this prayer somewhere amongst my readings yesterday. So if we'll bow our head. Oh, God of creation, as we welcome the autumn months, may the earlier setting of the sun remind us to take time to rest. May the brilliant colors of the leaves remind us of the wonder of your creation. May the steam of our breath in the coming cool air remind us that it is you who gave us that breath of life. May the harvest from the fields remind us of the abundance we have been given and the bounty we are to share with others. May the dying of summer spirit remind us of your great promise that death is temporary and life is eternal. We praise you for your goodness forever and ever. And Father, we truly do thank you for the opportunity to assemble here today in your house. And we thank you for the hand that you keep over us and our individual homes and families. We ask for your continued abundant blessings of love, mercy, grace, and peace over every single person here today, as well as to those of us who are housebound. We pray these things in the holy, mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, your only begotten Son, our Lord, Savior, and reigning King. Amen. 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 Thank you, Cindy. The one, capital O-N-E, that keeps us singing as we go is Jesus in all of life's ebb and flow. Would you sing it with us? Those within my heart are melody. Jesus whispers sweet I know. Be safe. 
together so each generation should set its hope anew on God not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands Psalm 78 verse 7 amen Good morning, I'm Miss Kathy, and my name is Lily, and we're from Kingdom Life Children's Church. Lily, the title of my devotion today is called, Start the Day Right. And Lily, would you share our Bible verse from the International Children's Bible? Yes. Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23. The Lord's love never ends. His mercies never stop. They are new every morning. Lord, your loyalty is great. Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23. Lily, the Bible tells us that each day is a day that God's faithfulness and mercy are fresh and new for you. Each morning, as soon as I wake up, Miss Kathy, I need to praise God for his faithfulness and his love. That's right, Lily. Waking up with God is the best way to start your day. And Lily, don't forget to ask God for help if you need it. I will start my day with God, Miss Kathy, and ask God for his help when I need it. That's a good idea, Lily. Would you pray? Yes. Father, I am so thankful for every brand new morning from you. Thank you that your love is with me every day. Father, bless our children today with love, joy, peace, and good health. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Remember, every morning is a new reminder of God's love. Bye. See Bye. you next time. Good morning. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Every day, right? Okay, it's that time when we've come together to worship and giving. Um, just gonna, uh, wow, what a week, right? 
What an exciting week. What a week to rejoice and be glad in spite of everything that comes our way that is called life, right? Just to encourage you with a little word before we get into a couple of announcements in worship and giving. Um, this has been a scripture that's really one of my favorites, go-tos. Um, in Psalms 138.8, well, let me say the for other one that go, I've tied into this. Psalms 119.89, it says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So I, I feel like I have a responsibility to establish the word that is settled in heaven here on this earth, right? And then Psalms 138.8 is another one that says the King James, New King James Version or King James says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Then it goes on to say, your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. I just want to read it to you from the um, Passion Translation. Because you know what? I just have to tell you, my confidence is in God. <laughs> My confidence is in man, not in man. It's in God. And then it says in the Passion Translation, this is to encourage you, but it's also encouraging me. It says, you, now we're talking about God. You keep every promise you've ever made to me. Since your love for me is constant and endless, this is Psalms 138.8, you keep every promise you've ever made to me. Since your love for me is constant and endless, I ask you, Lord, to finish every good thing that you've begun in me. And I have to add one more, because you see, I don't know about you, <laughs> I know about me, but every day is a good day, some are better than others, every week is a good week, but some are better than others, every year is a good year, but some are better than others, but on this road we call life's journey, forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven, my confidence is in you. Paul wrote to the um, Philippian church, and in Philippians 1, 6, I'm tying this into the other Psalms 138.8. See, God is, God is still at work around us in the midst of whatever it is. That, that's called stuff, life stuff, those Red Sea crises, those health challenge, those financial challenge, whatever they are. <laughs> My confidence is in him. And in Philippians 1, 6, Paul, Philippians 1, 6, Paul was praying for the Philippian church and he said, I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced, Paul says, that the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches to it until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just soak in that for a minute. Hey folks, <laughs> it's going to be all right. Because <laughs> it's just going to be day by day. I just feel real quickly right now before we finish Let's just pray for Sister Pearl Hubert. I just, Father, I just pray for Sister Pearl right now. Father, I just, I, I see a woman of faith. I experience this woman of faith, Sister Pearl. And even in the midst of what she deals with on a daily basis, I can see her faith. I can touch her faith. And Father, it's her faith that pleases you. 
and that's all that pleases you, our faith. And God, I'm, I'm, we're lifting up Sister Pearl right now because she is still faithful to you. And we're asking to be faithful to her and strengthen her body. Father, your word is true unto her. And God, we're asking that you would strengthen her. Everything that is not performing in the function that it should, it's not, it not, should be functioning, God, you're the God that created. And the doctors, we thank them for, we thank you for doctors. But would you strengthen Sister Pearl right now? In the name of Jesus, because, Father, she believes in your word, declares your word, and your word says, Isaiah 53, 5, 1 Peter 2, 24, that she is healed. So, Father, we ask you now to touch her and her son, Brad. In Jesus' name, we agree. Amen. And so now, to that moment, I just want to give you a little update on some information before we receive the offering. And looking at our envelope, our envelope gives all of the account names or the giving um, contribution, uh, giving categories that we have. Number one, just, you know, is tithe and general offerings. Those are unrestricted funds, and those funds go to, for all of the operations of the church. We're talking about the uh, taking care of the power bill and all the other bills and compensation. So those funds are unrestricted funds. However, on all of the other funds that are listed there, which are ministry, um, benevolence, um, building fund, and then uh, they, they are restricted funds. So we wanna make sure that you understand that. We actually just ordered new envelopes and I wish we had waited one more week. Well, two weeks almost, but because I want to give you an update. And any time that there is a special project, special offering um, that is received for a specific purpose and that is put under other, that becomes also restricted giving and it is designated for that particular purpose. In the example of today is October 25th, the day designated for Reformation Sunday uh, from the International Church of God. And Reformation Sunday is for a special offering to be received for retired ministers and widows. And so today, if you have that, you want to include it in your envelope, you would put that under other and just put R, capital RS, Reformation Sunday, or you can fill it out. But today I want to give you just a little update on what is on our envelope under building fund and to clarify any questions you may have, or if you have uh, questions, then you can get with Pastor and myself and the finance team. But um, you will notice there's been some information in the bulletin concerning the building fund. But to clarify our building fund giving policy, let me read it to you. And um, this was discussed in our Church and Pastors Council this past Tuesday. But just to give you an update that on that, and I'm going to read it. We are changing the name. It is officially becoming the Building Improvement Fund. When you see it on the envelope in the past, we've had building fund, but it's not a campaign um, that has been a campaign project for like raising funds for specifically for um, a new building. Our, it is really our building improvement fund. So I'm reading this to you and then it will be in the bulletin later. Covenant Life Church of God, in the exercise of its religious purposes, has established a building improvement fund to provide for the future needs of the church facilities at 706 Urich Street and the parsonage located at 3516 Starfish Avenue, Fruitland Park, Florida. The building improvement fund is used for major repairs, major remodeling, expansion or construction. The church welcomes contributions to the fund. The administration of the building improvement fund, including all disbursements, is subject to the control of the church and pastor's council and the treasurer administrative finance team. The church recognizes that planning for future needs is a practice of good stewardship and has established this fund as an ongoing fund. 
the Covenant Life Church of God Building Improvement Fund is restricted giving and therefore may only be used for the purposes of the fund to which the gift is designated. Should at any time in the future the Church and Pastors Council and Treasurer choose to close this fund, all money in the fund at that time will revert to the general administrative fund of the church. So that's your information. If you would like more information or have questions, please see me and um, I will talk to you and answer any questions that you have. And now, would you lift up your offerings? Tithe and your offerings. And we are going to put our confidence in who? In God. Amen. Let's um, pray over the offering and then we're going to um, sing to him. Amen. Father God, we thank you. Thank you with such a grateful heart today for your goodness and your mercy that follows us all, every day, every day of our life. I look behind, I look in front, I look to the side, I look up, but your goodness and mercy just follows, follows us. And today with a grateful heart we say thank you. Thank you for the gifts and the blessings. Thank you for the love and the care. Thank you Holy Spirit for being that counselor, advocate, intercessor, helper, strengthener, and stand by. And today, we bring the tithe and we bring the offerings and ask you, oh God, to bless and multiply it as we advance the kingdom of God through this local fellowship of Covenant Life Church of God. And because, Father, the giver has given, your word says that you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we can't even understand or have room to contain, that men will give into our bosom, press down, shaken together, and running over and father we thank you and lord in this time of 2020 on this day october the 25th 2020 father we just thank you that forever oh lord your word is established in heaven and we decree and declare that your word will be established here on this earth by your body the body of christ the believer and we thank you, Father. We thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We give you all the glory. We, we give, give you all the honor. honor. We give you all the praises. You are worthy of all praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. You are worthy of all praise. You are great. You do miracles, oh great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You are great. You do miracles, oh great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. There is no one else. There is no to give God the glory because that song just so reminds me some of you may know some do not know that as we left the church last Sunday we had a text from our daughter Lisa our oldest daughter who had been awakened at 2 a.m. with pain and um, 
we prayed for her, um, and um, then we got a, by the time we got home and got settled in, we got another text. Robert had Lisa at the emergency room at Advent Health. And um, you know what that means. It's like you can't be there with your loved one, but hey, I got confidence in the Most High God. And we sent his word. But as they examined Lisa and determined um, it was gallbladder, she's had some issues and had this test, that test, and all these tests, but none of these tests reveal that. But God knew. Yes. And so. We got later uh, from Robert, we received a text that they were admitting her that she was going to have surgery, have to have surgery as soon as possible. And so on mo last Monday, and you know, couldn't be there. So I was here in the office, but you just got confidence. Who, you, who, got, who have I got confidence in? <laughs> Only him. And so when um, the surgery's over, I just do the work you do, and, and my confidence is in him. But here's the miracle. Here's the miracle. See, the doctor said, because Lisa had, had felt, she's like, this, this isn't normal. This isn't normal pain. And she prayed, and she said, Mom, I just, I just gave myself. If it's not, I, it's to go. She said, I kept hearing this word, rupture not rapture, rupture. So the next day when they got in to do the surgery and then um, later when Lisa was able to understand and the doctor told her it was one, it, I've had worse, but yours was one of the worst I've ever seen. You were so close. It was already leaking and you were so close to it rupturing. If you understand that, and Miss Penny the nurse would, that she, if it had ruptured, her body would have gone into sepsis. So I'm here to tell you today, we've had a miracle. Amen. My daughter has also come, I mean, she had a, you know, she, you've heard this, like on Tuesday after the surgery and every day since, she's had a come to Jesus meeting, understanding that God was the one who protected her and mama and daddy's prayers and your prayers because immediately I sent um, prayer requests to Pastor and Sharon to the prayer team because I'm telling you my confidence is in him Amen. and he gets the glory. The doctors do what they can do and that is the wonderful thing. But to God be the glory today for he hath done great things. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He alone is worthy. We worship at the door. The Lamb of God, victorious. Exalt 
the name of Jesus. He is worthy. We exalt you, Lord. Exalt the name. I need you 
runs steep Your grace is Lord Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Lord, I am free Holy And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh God, how I need you. So teach me. i 
I worship you. 
Even when, when I don't see it, you're working. Even, even when, when I, I don't, don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, lie in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Named after a missionary that we support, Eddie Williams, who has malaria and he needs prayer. He's 10 years old. So we're going to pray for him. Joyce is going to lead us in prayer for him. The mom is washing his body to keep the down he's on they tried they didn't look at him for 24 hours Eddie got there and they started looking at him he said that child is named after me he says he needs help and they finally started looking at him then from what I understand from the text he has finally got to where they tried three treatments the first one didn't work the second one started messing with his kidneys I'm assuming it's the third one, but God, he's the miracle. Amen. He's the only one there in Africa. I don't know what kind of nursing or doctor seals they have in Africa, but they didn't even look at the boy. The mom is just continually wiping him down, just cherishing every moment. But I believe in this Lazarus came back up. If there's any breath gone or anything not working, that God can fix it. I've seen him do it. Amen. I've seen someone I prayed for at the hospital. She was they were rushing her to Gainesville. I said, can I have five minutes? He, he said, yes. I said, okay. So I asked her. She was forgiven. Her sins were forgiven. I saw her body go like this. When they got to Gainesville, they said, why is she here? I know God can do this. Yes. I don't have any doubt. When you were, when you were talking about that, I thought, well, okay. And then we started singing these songs. And I just pushed his heart and his finger right here. I needed to tell you that we've got to pray. His name is Eddie. Just like Eddie Williams, that we know this year in Africa. Yes. Yes. We need to see that. We need a corporate prayer. Yes. I know God hears him. I know he hears us. I know he hears Eddie. But my goodness. I want you to pray. Want me to pray? Yes. 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 Lord, you see this little boy yes, that you created. Yes, this yes, precious Lord. in your sight. Yes, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Your faith in you, Jesus. Yes. Yes, Father. Heavenly Father. There's no distance. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. The word of God that's the life of our faith. Yes, Lord. Rather than what we're extending our faith to be so bad. Yes, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We yes, Jesus. We power. Heal that. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We believe that the enemy is going to be defeated. We believe that healing is going to come. In the name of Jesus, my sister's Lord, is standing here in behalf of you. Her faith in God is reaching out to you, Lord, and that's the bridge that you're going to use to touch your young life. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we declare that he is coming to his house. And Lord, yes. we will restore yes, and make holes in the name of yes, Jesus. Lord. He 
shop at Don't sit today. back in your apathy. Oh Don't sit God. back in your comfort. Be brokenhearted. Be brokenhearted with me and shut cry it. out before me day and night for the nations. Cry out for the nations. Cry out for shut salvation. It. Cry out for healings to be released. Because I know in my shut word in the New Testament, it. when the people got healed, it did something to their heart and they quickly got saved. Those gifts that I've given you are to bless people, to increase people, to heal people, to deliver people. We'll start using them. Thank you, Jesus. They're not to be hidden inside of you. Start using those gifts that I've given you. They're for a purpose. And every part of me is behind the spirit. The full anointing of the Holy Spirit is in those gifts. And I tell you, the word Christ, the word Christian, the real Christ. I didn't call you little Jesus. I called you Christ because that's where the anointing is. You are my anointing to reach on this earth. So I'm going to be out front with you. Get busy. Get busy. Get busy. There is something all of us need to model. There's something all of us can do. I don't care if it's just pray a scripture or the same one. So anointing is on the word. Now tonight we're having prayer because I love the prayer. I would love all you to come. Because we're going to have a challenge in the Lord. He's going to do us some things. Now we can do it. Let's do look around so we're too small. We're too agreed to do anything on this earth. What do you say is going to happen? Tell me what's going to happen. He'll do it. Well, we're going to. So guess what? He'll do it. The real challenge for the church today is prayer. Amen. Because what we face is not going to yield to anything but the power of God. What we deal with is not going to be overcome except through the presence of God. With regard to this election, you should pray. And you should vote. Amen. And you should pray again. Amen. Sharon and I watched a couple, two or three videos this week that uh, Doug Small, the Apostle of Prayer in the Church of God, has given. And I want to share one of them with you today. You say, well, Pastor, why are we... Because it's teaching about prayer. And there's a very important thing that's going to be revealed in this that you're going to hear. I don't know if you, I don't know how much you pray with your Bible open, but that's the best way to pray. Open your Bible when you pray. Because God, like the Holy Spirit just said to us, will speak to you through His Word. And I want you to watch this video and then I'll come and share what the Lord's put in my heart for you today. together, the kings, plotting together against God, against his throne. The Bible says against his anointed, which is a reference to Christ. There is a spirit of Antichrist that has just manifest, it's just blown up in extraordinarily quick ways since the beginning of the new century here in America, and it's encircling the entire earth. We've never seen anything like this. This is Psalm 2 fulfilled. In Psalm 3, you get the rebellion of Absalom. So here, here's, what, here's what you see. You see international chaos and an antichrist spirit. And then you see the brokenness of the home itself and things so close to us that seem to be imploding. How do you navigate yourself through the craziness of the world and the implosions that even happen in your own family. Psalm 2, Psalm 3, follow Psalm 1. What's that? Blessed is the man. How does Psalm 1 end? He will
perish. The ungodly will perish. The difference between blessing and perishing, the way you navigate the chaos of the world, Psalm 2, and even family challenges, Psalm 3, is found in Psalm 1. You meditate in the Word of God. You plant yourself by the stream of the Holy Spirit. You take time every day to pray. You center yourself and anchor yourself securely in God. You, res you refuse the counsel of the world or, or, or coming to the place of sinners, the path of sinners where you have to make a choice and you're about to make the wrong choice. You don't want to end up in the seat of the scoffer, the one who has lost his faith altogether. So you meditate in the law of God or the Word of God. You actually pray it. You pray the Bible. You anchor yourself in the Bible. You see the world through the lens of the Bible. And, and, and this causes you to be like a tree that's planted, that gives forth its fruit in season. There's only one tree this can be. It's an evergreen and it also bears fruit. It's the olive tree and it has to do with the anointing. Father, would you help me understand that prayer is the means by which I anchor myself. I isolate myself, insulate myself, strengthen myself. When the world around me is falling apart, Psalm 2, when everything around me be, seems to be caught up in a spirit of Antichrist, and even in my own family, I'm experiencing challenges. Help me to understand praying over an open Bible, praying the Bible, praying through the lens of the Bible anchors me, strengthens me. It causes me to experience, to appropriate your blessing. It keeps me from perishing. It helps me make decisions between righteousness and sin. It keeps my attitude where it needs to be. It keeps me from being a scoffer, full of ridicule and cynicism. It purifies even my attitude. It causes me to not wither away in the heat of some day because I have taken in the Spirit of God during that morning. Teach us to pray. Psalm 1 begins with a call. It's a Torah psalm. It's a, it's a call to pray the Word. And Psalm 150 ends. Psalm 150 ends, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You navigate through the messiness of life by praying scripture. You navigate through the messiness of the culture and even family life by praying scripture, by setting the trajectory of your life over an open Bible every day in prayer, by praying not in reaction to the world or the attacks of the evil one, but by praying thus saith the word of God. God. Go to you, uh, and Sunday morning's the best time because we want to get everybody we can. So be sharing those with you and uh, anytime you want to watch them you can go on uh, we pray well, yeah we pray COG there we go and watch them yourself and uh, if you need help Molly can help you <laughs> she helps me a lot <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> you know I got something out of those two songs learning to lean I lean on you Lord it was like a question was posed to me. Do you have the lean? Do you have the lean? Look at your neighbor and ask them that question. Do you have the lean? Do you have the lean? Amen. Well, I don't want to preach about that today, but I do want to preach about the kingdom of heaven. How many are looking forward to going to heaven? Well... You can get there to some degree right now. There's a song that says, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. 
Matthew 13 presents the story of a present and future kingdom called the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus introduces parables to teach important lessons about the kingdom he came to establish. Parables are simple stories taken from life activities and they're used to give a greater lesson on spiritual truth and activity. In verses 10 through 13, he, Jesus, explained why. Here's what it says in verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them, the crowd, in parables? And he answered and said to them in verse 11, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And if you got your head down, I'm pointing at you. It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, the crowd, it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance and Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. Verse 13, Therefore I speak to you in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. You know, one of the problems about Christianity on earth is the translation the translation. We, we sometimes speak a certain language that is foreign to people out there in the world as Christians. And yet we are called to translate what it means to be a Christian, a believer who's going to heaven to the world around us. That means the very people who need the same assurance that they too can go to heaven. Here's a few things I wanna, I wanna say that I think are important to our understanding here. First of all, I'm gonna go in, in the 11th chapter of Revelation verse 15, there's a seventh trumpet sounded and here's, here's what that trumpet was about. The seventh angel sounded the trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world. Everybody say that. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ. The sounding of the seventh trumpet signaled the consummation of God's reign in the earth. The mystery of God, Revelation 10, 7 says, is finished. It's finished. That is, even the smallest child will be able to understand who God is. What God is to us. And, and what He has done and is doing and will do for us. Parables teach those who are on the kingdom track, but those who are not will not understand them. Jesus gave 40 parables in the Gospels to teach his followers important kingdom lessons. Of those 40 parables, he made reference to the kingdom in 19. Could have been kingdom of heaven, could have been kingdom of God, but he made reference to the kingdom in 19. These parables are stories clearly relate to different time frames. Some impact the present teaching. That one, the need for kingdom people to have hearing ears. Faith comes by and hearing by. And two, the breadth of the kingdom's spread, verses 31 through 35, talks about that. 
And number three, the cost of the kingdom's acquisition. What does it cost to acquire an understanding of the kingdom of heaven? Others relate to the future teaching, the final disposing of the truth of the adversary's hindrance. You know, when they're all gathered up and they're sorted out. When we are all gathered up and we're sorted out, and the good go this way and the bad go that way. Maybe that's wrong, but anyway, you you know what it is. And then the final disposition of the mixed in gathering from kingdom outreach. The net, the dragnet. In mixing these two aspects of the kingdom, Jesus helps us appreciate the kingdoms as both present, here and now, and prospective or future. The kingdom is now because we are saved and growing in faith and worshiping God and experiencing His presence and His blessings in our lives. It is future because what is now a spiritual kingdom received by faith will become a literal kingdom when Jesus comes back to the earth again. In verse 13, Jesus' words read, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. This was shared in response to the inquiry of the disciples. Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus' response was that this use of parables fulfills the prophecy of the prophet Isaiah. And in chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, you can go there and read what he said. Verses 14 through 17 gives helpful illustration as well from Matthew uh, chapter 13. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I could heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now remember, he's talking to the disciples in this verse. Blessed are your eyes, For they see, and your ears, because you hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. What was that? The revelation of Jesus Christ. The revealing of the Son of God, and when He was born of a virgin. And the first Christmas was celebrated... The world began to know God through the revelation of His Son. Many prophets, many good people looked for that day and died before it ever came. The stubborn refusal of the Jewish leaders and teachers of the law to accept and embrace Jesus as the promised Messiah cost them and their nation dearly. These parables Jesus told are simple stories of everyday life used to illustrate how the kingdom of heaven comes to us. Or to anyone, for that matter, who will embrace it. There is nothing unusual about how a seed produces a harvest. We just know it does. You plant it in the ground, it's going to produce some beans or cucumbers, or tomatoes. There is nothing unusual and certainly would not have been unusual to the hearers of Jesus' day that a tiny mustard seed grows into a tree big enough to give shade. And there's nothing unusual about a small amount of leaven deposited into dough for bread that it's distributed throughout the entire bread mixture by the kneading process 
and affects everything in the bread. Hallelujah. I'm thinking about that sourdough bread right now. <laughs> Don't go there yet. I'll let you go in a minute. The stories Jesus used to tell kingdom stories were common everyday occurrences of the people to whom he was speaking. Nothing complicated about it. Nothing sensational about it. They just understood the kingdom based upon the stories. What was hidden, the stories revealed. I want to use two of the shorter parables from Matthew 13 today to stimulate our thinking. They're in verses 44, 45, and 46. The first one is the parable of the hidden treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. He found it, then hid it? Yeah, he found it and then he hid it. And here's why. Because he went and sold everything he had because of the joy he had over finding that treasure. And then he went and bought that field. Oh, why didn't he just take the treasure? Because he had to buy the field. Honest people are going to be honest even when they find something they could claim as their own and not have to leave it in the field. Then there's the parable of the, great, the pearl of great price. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. These are two interesting parables. They both stress the superlative value of the kingdom. It's talking about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. The most common interpretation is that a person should be willing to part with everything in order to possess the kingdom. There is another thought about this, though, that deserves our attention and our thought. This meaning could be that Jesus is the purchaser who found the treasure in the field and the pearl of great price and gave his own life, everything he had, gave it all to purchase the field and the pearl. The first thing I want to say is that the kingdom of heaven does not come from earthly things, it comes from Heaven. Heaven. You're not going to find it somewhere in Target or Walmart and find books about it. You're not going to find it on your job through the people that own the company. You're going to find out about the kingdom of heaven through this book called the Bible through opening it up and reading what it says, and through praying your way through, just like Doug Small said, praying your way through what this book teaches you. Matthew 13, 44 through 46 challenges us to believe and to be passionate about what we believe. The man who found the treasure was so passionate about owning the treasure that he reburied it, took a risk that it wouldn't be there when he came back with the title deed to the land. Took a risk, reburied it, went and sold everything he had and went to the man who owned the field and bought it. I don't know what the price was and there was no haggling. Because when he said, I'll give you this much for the field, the man said, I want more, I'll give you more. What is your price? It was worth it. Because that person who wanted to buy that field knew there was a treasure there waiting for him. The pearl story is the same thing. The pearl of great price. Question. What do you value in life more than anything else? See, I knew he was coming to this. I knew he was going to ask me that. What do you value in life more than anything else? 
Have you found a treasure so captivating you devoted all of your life resources to have it? Have you found the great pearl? I thought about this when I asked that question to myself first. Heaven's gates are made of one solid pearl. Did you know that? That is amazing. It is amazing. And here, it's talking about a pearl of great price. The gates of heaven, one solid pearl. Kingdom of heaven is accessed through gates of pearl. You know, good preachers would go a lot further with that, but I got more to say. So, have you found the great pearl? In essence, the work of the church, in essence, the work the church does helps to establish the kingdom of heaven here on earth. As the church's influence and success grows, so the kingdom of heaven expands. I thought Miss Linda was going to preach part of my sermon this morning because she said something to that effect. And, and what that said to me was, hey, you're on the right track here. You're on the right track. And I've been saying this to you for a while, and I'm, I'm going to say it again right here. If what happens in here does not translate out there, what happens in here is useless. Amen. If it's just to bless us for and no more, our thinking is too small. I said our thinking is too small. Amen. God loves the least, the lost, the left out, the ones you don't like, the ones I don't like. God loves them all. Yep. And we can be glad because one day we found out He loved us and saved us from our sin. Recently, I told you about living on earth with heaven in view. Well, living on earth with heaven in focus is a great necessity if the citizenship of heaven has increased. I suppose there could be some Christians who really are so heavenly minded they are of no earthly good. <laughs> but a lot of them I've met who are too earthly minded to be of any heavenly good here on earth. Heaven comes into focus through the lens of the Bible. And you say, you said that already. Well, I'm going to say it again. It comes into focus through the lens of the Bible. As we read it, the Holy Spirit is present to provide understanding of what we read. When God's people look to His Word and read it, study it, apply it, and live by faith in it, amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. Here's, here's one, and it's, it's my testimony this morning in this sermon. Jesus thought I was worth saving so he gave his life for mine if you are a believer he thought you were worth saving so he gave his life for yours that's what literally happened when he died on the cross and drew his last breath, he gave his life for ours. That's beyond my mind to comprehend that someone would die for me. I can kind of wrap my mind around people who go to war and lose their lives defending their country. But a man who did not know me, did not know anything about me, really knew everything about me. Knew everything about you. Gave his life for mine, for yours. It's a matter of biblical fact. 
Jesus gave his life for every person who was ever born on earth or ever will be born or even conceived. Because as we know, life, not just when the child is born, it's when they are conceived. Because they are conceived in the image of God. And all those whose lives have been taken, they're in heaven. I heard somebody say one time, I sort of picture God as like a grandfather. Just loving on his grandkids, enjoying life with them. Don't you know God is so happy right now? The millions and millions of aborted babies who are there with him. Ah. Better to go down in the fight for faith in this world than to go down to eternal defeat because we do not believe. None of us are promised to live eternally down here, but we are all promised to live eternally in the hereafter. Some to death and destruction, some to judgment and the penalty of judgment, but others to righteousness, to heaven, to heaven. In Matthew 16, 24 through 26, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Or what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for their soul? Let me paint a picture for you that's not too pleasant. There are many people in hell today who would give a thousand lifetimes of earnings to be out of it. But it's never going to happen. It's not going to happen. Again, a question. What are you looking for? And how bad do you want it? What are you looking for? And how bad do you want it? When Jesus came, he was looking for a kingdom not of this world. What did he find? He found you and me, common, ordinary people who needed some hope, who needed a hand up, not a hand out, a hand up, who needed some inspiration to begin the journey of a better life, who needed some freedom from the oppression of darkness and evil. That's what he found. He brought the power to deal with all of that. He wanted the kingdom promise that was made to him by his father, so he gave up everything to purchase that kingdom. What are you looking for? It doesn't get any better than eternal life. What would, what would you give for your soul salvation? I just got to say this again because I've been singing that little song ever since my wife sent me the video of it or the transcription thing of it and I heard it. It just rings over and over in my mind. He thought I was worth saving. He thought you were worth saving. I have no delusions about me. I might have some about others, but not about me. I know who I am. I know what I have done. I know what I am capable of doing. And I know also that I am incapable of saving myself. And so are we all. But Jesus not only is capable... He said, if you call on him, he'll answer. 
He'll come. I want you to bow your head with me. Father, as we come to the close of this service, I pray, Lord, that our minds will wrap around this thought about the kingdom of heaven. And I pray, Father, that every person here today will experience the touch of heaven in a way that moves us, that motivates us, that empowers us, that delivers us. I pray, Lord, that our feet will begin to dance at the lightest provocation of heaven's influence. I pray that our hands will be lifted in surrender to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who reigns in heaven today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to be agents of the kingdom of heaven, dispensers of what it means to be a citizen of heaven even while here on earth, to be promised eternal life while we're living in this finite world, to be given the hope that goes beyond all that there is, is amazing, Lord, mind-boggling. Father, I just, I know there may be some who watch video of this service, so I I just want to pray a prayer for every person, not just those here, but those watching. So, first of all, would you repeat this prayer after me? It's a simple prayer of salvation. Lord Jesus, Please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of unrighteousness. Make me a child of God. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe in your word. And I confess today that you are my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, as we prayed that prayer, I am believing that the power of the Holy Spirit is already at work. Not just in us who are here, but in those who will pray this prayer as this this transcript goes out to others, this video. I pray, Father, that throughout the land there will be prayers heard, prayers of confession, Prayers of dependence. Prayers that are desperate. Prayers that need answers. I pray that prayers will be heard from the greatest of our land to the poorest and those most neglected. And I pray, O Lord, that you will hear and answer the prayers that are prayed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you and thank you so much for being here. Let me share this with you before we go. Mary Stout had to go back to ER yesterday. Some of you know she was there and had prayer. And uh, she, she had some sensations going on that were not normal. And she went, and she's not, she's not in the heart ward anymore. She is in the neurological ward. So they're doing some testing, and hopefully she'll be back home, but please keep her in your prayers. And everybody else that, uh, I think there's some in our bulletin today and different ones who have needs. We're grateful for what happened with uh, Brother Jim, Sister Linda's daughter this week. It's faith building, <laughs> truly faith building. Amen. Amen. So hold out your hands and just let me say the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. I hope he's laughing at you when you wake up in the morning and you laugh with him. May he keep you in his peace and his love and sustain you by his grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
God bless you. Thank you for being here today.